You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Today's sponsor, Curiosity Stream, is Smart TV for your smart TV. Curiosity Stream has thousands of streamable documentaries and non-fiction TV shows on topics like history, nature, science, food, technology, travel, and more. Last year on the show, I discussed in detail with NASA's chief scientist, Dr. Jim Green, about the search for life in our solar system. And with the recent landing of Perseverance on Mars, I streamed Hunting for Martian Life, the Perseverance rover, which shows with fantastic animations just how Perseverance may be able to answer the question, did life exist on the Red Planet? Use code Event Horizon to sign up, just $14.99 for the whole year. And keep in mind with Curiosity Stream's award-winning exclusives and originals, you are able to stream to any device for viewing anytime, anywhere. So use the code Event Horizon to sign up, just $14.99 for the whole year. Alexei Bobrik and Gianni Martiri, welcome to the program. Thank you, Thank you so much. Now, gentlemen, you have an interesting new idea. This is a realistic take on an old idea, a warp drive. Now, warp drive in general has been viewed in terms of the Alcubierre drive, at least since the 1990s when he formulated the idea. But the Alcubierre drive has multiple problems that take it outside of the world of known physics and put it, puts it in a weird area where you need things like negative mass and you need um, enormous amounts of energy and you have a radiation problem. So there are many problems with the Alcubierre drive. But when you start looking at the concept as subluminal, meaning slower than the speed of light, it becomes a different animal and that's where you guys are working. So we want to make it clear that this is not faster than light travel. We're talking about here from the get go. We're talking about propulsion within the confines of Newtonian physics and relativity. Give me an overview on the basic idea of your warp drive. Well, um, I'd say, you know, uh, we, we, we explored from the start, really, what is an Alcubierre drive, but then we came to the picture of what a general warp drive is. And if you think what a general warp drive is, I think the easiest way to understand it is by kind of imagining how you make it step by step out of nothing, little step by little step. And then uh, the way I personally visualize that is imagine we have absolutely nothing, then we take a little bit of material, make a spherical shell of that material, and then we little by little make that shell more and more massive. And then once the shell gets more and more massive, it has more and more influence on the area enclosed in the shell, on the space-time inside. And uh, once we get the shell to have really large mass, like significant, the effect on the space-time inside will be also significant. And that's where this sort of like warp regime starts. So um, a warp drive basically is a shell of very massive material which somehow affects how the time goes or how the space is kind of arranged inside it. And we can talk a bit more about that. Uh, and then if that sort of shell moves, then it's a moving warp drive. And uh, Alcubierre warp drive and any other warp drive can be visualized that way, basically. Now, in a subluminal sense, though, you're simply adding mass, which already exists in the universe, to create the effect, right? Uh, indeed so. So in principle, um, so if... Indeed so. So uh, we can create a real proper subliminal wall drive by using just positive mass. And uh, in fact, the effects of just using this positive mass are quite well understood. So uh, specifically, for example, if we, if we create a spherically shaped shell with positive mass, then we know that the time inside it gonna, is going to go slower. So for example, um, you know, if we, if we take a person and uh, keep the person for a year inside the shell, so due to the shell's mass, the person could come out a year after and be only one month older, for example, just because the shell was so massive. Um, Alcubierre drive would be constructed in a similar way, but unfortunately, Alcubierre drive requires negative energy. And uh, if you try to construct negative energy, Alcubierre warp drive, then it's not physical, just doesn't exist. And uh, um, so that's that's one distinction. And uh, another distinction is usually people have been talking about Alcubierre warp drive in the superluminal regime because in subluminal, it's even less interesting. Um, so, the, I mean, why would one build Alcubierre warp drive in the subluminal regime with negative energy? Um, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you think about the time, for example, inside Alcubierre warp drive, 
uh, then in fact time inside the copy of drive goes faster than it would have gone for a person outside of a warp drive well my question about positive mass is this is how much positive mass are we talking about to begin to create the effect and do we run into the problem of gravity? I mean, would you, if you're sitting inside of the shell, would you get spaghettified or, or pulled apart? Or would you be stationary in the center of the shell under very high gravitational influence, which is dilating time? Mm. Uh, both are very good questions. And uh, so uh, first question really is like, how much mass do we really need to do something interesting? Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll give three scales uh, which are relevant. So one is that if you take uh, an object of the mass of the sun, for example, a star or uh, uh, something of the mass of the sun, uh, then for it to lead some to lead to some interesting effects, it has to be compressed to the sizes of order of a few kilometers, maybe ten kilometers. Uh, so if you want to uh, get an if you, if you wanted to get an object which uh, does something interesting uh, is of the size of uh, some ten meters, then it has to be of the mass of Jupiter or so. Planet Jupiter, uh, which is about one thousand smaller uh, in mass than, 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 than the Sun. Uh, and if you take an object of the mass of the Earth and wanted to do something interesting space time inside it, it has to be compressed to uh, a size of like something roughly like a centimeter or a few millimeters. Uh, so, I mean, that is the scales when the effects will become significant, and that's uh, the scales when the time inside that shell will go really quite significantly slower than it would have been going otherwise. Now, uh, we can also imagine, of course, that we take the mass of the Earth and, for example, make an object not as small as a few millimeters, centimeters, but make it much larger. But then the effect on time is also going to be smaller. So, for example, if you take the mass of the Earth and make it 10 meter size, then the effect on the rate of time is also going to be smaller in proportion to the size, actually. So, uh, for example, 10 meter sized Earth mass shell will make the, uh, the, the time go slower by one second in an hour or something like that. Um, and then to your second question, so if, if you take a spherical shell, actually there will be no gravity forces inside it. So that actually is a result which is known from uh, Newtonian gravity, but it also calls for the uh, for the general relativistic spherical shells. Uh, namely that if we are inside a spherically symmetric shell, then uh, inside that shell there will be no force of gravity. So actually um, there will be no so-called tidal forces. There will be nothing stretching or nothing really well, experienced by the people inside, it will actually appear just the same as just empty space. Um, but nevertheless, the time will go differently. So that's somehow related to the fact that the potential, the gravitational potential, or people say metric uh, inside the spherical shell is somehow different compared to metric uh, or potential far outside from the shell. So the time actually does go differently. Um, and interestingly, for example, if you took, for example, spherical shell of imaginary, uh, non-existent uh, negative energy, then the time would go faster. But if you take shell of positive, realistic matter, uh, positive mass matter, then the time goes slower inside such shells. Uh, and yet, interestingly, so actually so far, uh, at least based on, on our paper and uh, just generally on the equations, if you take really um, appropriately chosen mass of the shell so that the radius of the shell is comparable to the so-called Schwarzschild or gravitational radius of it, so the time dilation inside of it can be almost arbitrarily small. So in other words, one could kind of almost freeze the time inside the shell. Uh, although, uh, just a disclaimer, so that just we didn't check if such shells are gravitationally, I mean, stable against gravitational collapse and so on. So I mean, we do not say that it's really like fully checked in a sense, but I mean, uh, at least uh, in principle, if one can arrange the matter, positive mass matter, in such a way that its radius is comparable to the mass of the to the radius of, to the creation radius of the black hole, uh, then the time in there can actually be almost frozen, uh, which is which is just interesting. Now, almost frozen. In other words, you've you've you're 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 approaching the speed of light. You're approaching the point at which time stops. You can't ever get there, but you're approaching it where time can almost stop. That would allow you to travel, say you could accelerate your sphere. That would allow you to travel immense distances within the observable universe from your perspective inside the shell in a very short time. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, yes, indeed. So actually it's um, indeed it, it one of the interesting consequences of these sort of solutions. Um, well, uh, 
first a disclaimer that you know like uh, the effect has been known since the special relativity time so there's also this so-called Lorentz time dilation so if you have an object which moves very quickly close to the speed of light then the time is also dilated for such an object so uh, for example I could advertise a very nice video by uh, David Keeping on just this fact so for example if you take a person subject to constant uh, acceleration which is equal to 1g and that's the acceleration we have when standing on the ground on the earth uh, so 9.8 meters per second square, uh, then a person subject to that acceleration for their lifetime will be able to reach the edge of the universe in their lifetime. It's just, it's, it's an astonishing fact, but in reality it's actually nothing crazy, it's completely reasonable conventional physics. So uh, when the person is subject to a constant acceleration of this 9.8 meters per second square, uh, their speed quite quickly increases to the speed, close to the speed of light and then it gets continuously closer and closer to the speed of light and this this relativity effect which makes the time go slower as you get closer to the speed of light and so this way you can travel really immense distances um, by just like having this uh, very high velocity and uh, indeed reach the edge of the observable universe. Now the good thing about these warp solutions is that you can get this sort of uh, time dilation by just entering a region in space-time because you have such a massive shell. You don't need to accelerate to, to, to velocities close to the speed of light. You can actually enter a shell which almost freezes the time and uh, have that shell moving by like quite reasonable conventional velocities of, I don't know, might be like half of the speed of light or maybe one tenth or maybe one hundredth of the speed of light. But if the time there is really very, very much slowed down, then in principle I could imagine a case, just hypothetically for example, that uh, the time has been slowed down by a factor of, I don't know, 1000, which is really extreme, maybe it sounds extreme. Uh, and then, um, for example, the object moves at velocity of like one hundredth or of the speed of light, then effectively from the point of view of the passenger, the passenger is as if moving at the speed of 10 times the speed of light because like it's uh, velocity is 100 times the speed of light, but inside the time goes slower by 1,000 times. So in effect, for the for the person, in like from their perspective, it looks as if they have been traveling 10 times faster than the speed of light, um, which is kind of interesting. Okay, now this could be called efficiency in time dilation. In other words, you've come up with a way to make time dilation more efficient. Am I characterizing that correctly? I'd say yes. So in the sense that one could have controlled time dilation uh, in, in a way. And um, well, I mean, that, that should, should of course all be uh, further checked and one should really check that there are materials which can support all that and so on and so on. Uh, but in principle, uh, I mean, theoretically so far, there are no obvious obstacle why shouldn't one be able to slow down the time almost arbitrarily. Um, so, um, and uh, that is without really, again, without without reaching superliminal or without reaching very high velocities uh, and uh, close to close to close to the speed of light and uh, that is um, yeah if I mean one can effectively get this sort of like effectively effectively superliminal travel but in reality it is normal conventional subliminal travel but from the point of view of the passenger it's as if it's superliminal but from the point of view of the you know of people who are outside of the traveling you know object from, from their point of view it's totally subliminal travel. Now, Gianni, I have a an everyday man question regarding all of this. So, if you could if you could step into the sphere, say we have it sitting out there stationary and producing its gravity and doing its thing, you could use that as a forwards time travel machine. In other words, you could launch yourself from your rocket, climb into the sphere, stay there for X amount of time, and step out, and you are in Earth of the future, right? Yes. Uh, you could do you could do that. Um, I don't see why you would do that uh, for the Earth of the future, but for distances, yes, uh, you could in theory do that. So the, the one thing I want to outline that Alexi is saying, just to make it more simplistic views, is the one big thing that we clarified with the Akabiri drive and with this drive is time was, a, the Akabiri drive was assumed to go faster than light. And in our paper, we actually show mathematically and we prove that scientifically. That was a false assumption. Like, it does not do that. Uh, there's, there's no data to support that. And, you know, people were disappointed because it's like, okay, now you have no solution that gets us anything faster than light. You've actually disproved anything that was out there that was uh, hopeful. Uh, but the good news is we keep reading our paper. Uh, you then realize, like, yes, we may have bursted like, a bubble or two and corrected some things in the field, which is natural. It happens in science all the time. Uh, but we also added some new solutions. So the, the fun thing is... You know, you, again, you can't move, accelerate outside the bubble faster than light because everything in general relativity. But when you combine that with the inside force, so you could be moving at 20% the speed of light outside the bubble, which is not that fast uh, when you think of relative wise. And you can in, still, in theory, 
go to like you know the Andromeda Galaxy because you're moving so much time so much faster inside the bubble that within ten years of your lifetime you achieve that. Uh, but of course, when you come back, all your friends and relatives uh, you know, will be deceased because so much time has passed. Because uh, again, you can't go backwards, as we all know. Uh, but yeah, that's that's basically the the thing that uh, that we we've, uh, we've outlined in our metric, which we show. It's like so. It, it can still be achieved. This is a different, quirkier way that was described before. Uh, but does that make sense? It does. All right. Now, I have a question. Yet yeah, many questions, actually. So this would allow you to do some strange things. Having a static, essentially forward-moving time machine sitting in the solar system. Meaning that you could create a time capsule. And we could take, like we do with buildings, we could take a bunch of culturally relevant items, you know, objects, things that may be useful for the future, um, seeds, genetics, you know, things that may have gone extinct by their time, and send them to the future. We could actually send a time capsule to a future humanity using this, right? Yeah, that sounds very useful. In fact, I mean, quite imaginably, I mean, uh, back when I was a student, the physicist students were kind of joking about this um, best use of LHC. So the joke went as like, you know, so if, it, if you have LHC, then in LHC, of course, there are all those um, particles accelerated to some kind of like some number of tera electron volts, and that's really close to the speed of light. So kind of ideally, you could uh, imagine putting yourself, uh, take, taking a sandwich, putting it into LHC, letting it move with the speed of light, and then it will be preserved for a week instead of just uh, getting in bed in one day. So you kind of could imagine superluminal speed, for example, ah, you could imagine a very close to speed of light speed uh, being used as a sort of like an effective fridge for sandwiches. But now uh, to advertise our new solution, for example, you could take just a warp drive or kind of this time capsule and uh, put inside a sandwich and it has much benefits because you don't have to accelerate a sandwich to the speed of light and you don't need to destroy it or kind of do these crazy things to to the sandwich. And then uh, you, you put it there and take it out uh, one week later and that's uh, everyday usage of the of a time capsule. Uh, but uh, I, I totally agree having a higher uh, kind of more, more noble goals of uh, preserving species or for example having seeds left for uh, for later, or perhaps maybe um, having something time sensitive, which you would like to preserve. I mean, I think that is actually quite quite a few of those fascinating things one can do with such a time capsule, indeed. Well, think of think of think of the Romans. You mm. know, the Greco-Roman period, where if they had such a thing, they could have put all of their literature that we're now missing inside there and sent it to, to us in the future, and thus by preserved it. Um, if we were to have some sort of uh, Let's say a solar flare or something like that hits, we could preserve data, you know, and just have it to be downloaded at some point in and the future. So there's there's all kinds of things you could do. And here's the good news: the uh, that's actually much easier to achieve than a Starship, because again, like to the physics of like as you're noticing, the bigger the object, then the faster we're moving it, the more energy it's going to take. The more energy, the more sophisticated the you know, civilization has to be to harness that levels of energy. But when you're talking about an object that just needs to go forward to the future, just say a hundred years. Um, and again, it just stays here, uh, and it's small. It's relatively very small. That requires a lot less energy. That's a lot, le a lot more doable. So it's not an efficient space capsule, but as an efficient time capsule, you would actually have that first because it's just easier from a physics standpoint and technological standpoint. You'll have that technology before you have the interstellar, uh, the really neat technology. Uh, so again, it's, uh, it's an interesting idea. We've actually never talked about that uh, time capsule idea in, in any of our uh, scientific cohorts, which... No, we, we try to talk about like, you know, all these case uses and stuff. Uh, so like, uh, this is very interesting uh, of a concept. But yeah, you, you could use it for that, and it actually would be pretty practical. And that sandwich will still taste pretty damn good. It would be, uh, it'd be preserved. And the sandwich would never have known what would happen. You actually you have no sense of motion in these things. So it's, uh, it's quite boring, actually, when you're in this. One could prove in the future that ham sandwiches had not changed because we have a preserved hand sa ham sandwich inside of the uh, war bubble. But this brings up another idea. Since this is an interesting way to preserve things for the future, could a dying alien civilization build something like this and preserve some core of their culture in a Star Trek-like scenario and leave it out there to be discovered? And if you could discover it, would such a warp structure, we'll call it a warp structure for, for these purposes, would that be detectable as something weird? You know, this is not a normal exoplanet or something like that. Well, I would say, right. So, um, hmm. so for, 
for preserving the species, I think it makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, for example, we could imagine, you know, I mean, just, just think about humanity, right? So, I mean, for example, uh, a few hundred years ago, there were diseases which are now treatable very easily. So, for example, you could just imagine that, for example, some, you know, for some reason, people would like to just, you know, stay, stay still be alive, like a few hundred years later, maybe for, for treating some, you know, something. Um, now, uh, or for example, the dying alien civilization could, in principle, imaginably put themselves in a time capsule, hoping to be found by some more advanced civilization and saving them or something like that. Um, for them to be fa findable, uh, the, just just the warp structure itself would not perhaps be sufficient. So, uh, warp structure itself would be visible, perhaps, or manifesting itself by producing a lot of gravitational field around it, but we know of many, many astrophysical objects which produce a gravitational field around them and are very hard to find. Just a good example being black holes, uh, which are notoriously hard to find if the black hole is not, is not having anything next to it, because black hole is just black and it gravitates but doesn't really show it somehow visibly too much. So, I mean, uh, so those, uh, the, this dialing alien civilization would have two things to solve. One is to create this warp structure and get into it, and the second one is to create a, a very obvious kind of like signal source uh, for others to find it and then perhaps uh, that could be possible to do i mean i guess uh, if, if they studied astrophysics uh, well enough then they would probably find a way to create some unusual type of signal which we never see from anything else and um, kind of try to put some information in it uh, so that it's decodable understandable kind of so that p patterns are being seen and that they could be interpreted as information so i mean i, I, I guess that would probably po be possible to to do and uh, i should mention by the way so just uh, you know since we're talking about that so that actually there's there's quite a lot of research uh, in the astrophysics community in astrobiology community wherein people are actually looking for possible signs of uh, life on other in, in other stellar planetary systems and uh, even other galaxies and sort of like in all different sorts of manifestations of that starting from like kind of this uh, very primitive like subcellular, so like kind of pre-cellular life, uh, ending up with the sort of like potential life forms which could occupy, you know, stars and would that be actually detectable in our current extensive surveys of other stars and galaxies and uh, so far, well as we all know, there's no clear evidence for any uh, other life source, but in principle uh, what could, one could imagine is actually we are able to, so one could imagine we are able to put constraints on the on the um, presence and, and diversity of life which is out there because we in principle can quite confidently say for example there's no you know obvious you know other galaxy which has been completely transformed by life in like sort of like obvious way or there's no like techno signatures uh, seen around other stars as far as we can say um so those sorts of things are quite interestingly can be constrained and quite could could almost be detected by the present day human you know civilization and i could imagine that in the future, they probably the possibilities will be yet more extensive. Now, moving the constructed warp bubble and using it to travel to, say, Proxima Centauri, there doesn't there really isn't any constraint that I can see on any method of moving it. I mean, you could connect a rocket to it or something like that, or you know, whatever what whatever propulsion you you want to get it up to whatever speed you want, so long as you don't exceed the speed of light or you don't really get near it because of the energy requirements that are, you know, exponentially go up. But if we could build it, actually moving it is very straightforward and not really much different than moving any other physical object that we might do. I mean, granted, right now, all, all, all we might be able to do is move a little light sail or something like that with a laser. But if we had a lot of power, you know, we could move this thing and with time being dilated, you could be to Alpha, you know, or Proxima Centauri in a very short amount of time. I mean, given say you're going half the speed of light or something like that, you'd be there in almost no time at all, right? Well, I'd say yes and no. Uh, so, I mean, I think I think one way to look at it is that um, okay. So, if if we are able to build a Jupiter mass sort of like warp structure, then Probably, if you're able to do this, then we probably will be able to accelerate it as well because it's, I mean, like, it kind of gather mass of Jupiter into, like, one sphere and then then we can do other kind of cool things. Uh, so in that sense, we probably, I mean, that probably should be straightforward. On the other hand, you know, um, it, it is completely correct to say that, you know, propulsion should be working just in a very similar way as it works for rockets and uh, in the same way as, we, you know, 
for planes, rockets, and all the uh, other types of space engines which have been proposed. Um, the well, that, that's the good side. The bad side is that you know it's it's easy, but also it's hard because you know we we know that. For for example, for rockets, we also have limitations. We can't, for example, use the rocket fuel to make super fast rockets. We have limitations in speed, and uh, we can also we can't also. I mean, so we, we're kind of limited to what is practically possible to do with existing propulsion systems, and that of course applies to any uh, warp structures we can imagine and any possible acceleration methods for warp structures. Yeah. And I see Johnny has. Uh, has, well, uh, just, has just, saying, uh, just to simply add to it, the, uh, you wouldn't use chemical rockets, uh, but what you would use would actually be really practical in space uh, is fusion. Uh, and the thing is, the reason why fusion, you know, we have such impracticalities of you know, achieving sustainable fusion here on Earth is because we don't have the right ingredients. We don't have helium-3. Uh, helium-3 is very abundant through the universe because every star ejects helium-3, but our atmosphere unfortunately deflects it. So like when you have, uh, but now if you're in space, uh, honestly, like you could just go near a star and literally fill up on helium three and get your fusion propulsion going. Like all in theory, like why can't you do that? The answer is there's no reason. You just have to have the technical capabilities to do that. Uh, but you would have the stars literally be your gas stations. Because again, if you're going to use something to power yourself throughout the universe, you know there's there's a source. So there's a real science that we all know about. This is fusion. This is very old. Um, and again, we even have China to this day, they're mining the moon for helium-3, they're bringing it back because they want to be the first civilization to have, you know, sustainable fusion. Because again, it's going to be a huge step in humanity. So it, in terms of like the power in this, it, it gets really practical. Uh, the stars literally will power the Starcraft. Because uh, what else was going to power this thing? Well, now there's an elephant in the room here. Uh, nature. Nature can accelerate stars and planets on its own. So through the interaction, say, with a binary star system, which we happen to be located next to one, Alpha Centauri, you could gravitationally eject the spacecraft to go across the galaxy if you had just exactly the right way, if you could get it moving, and you could get it at the right angle to go into you know, a system like that, or even a double black hole or double neutron star or something like that, and just toss that thing at relativistic speeds because that's possible because nature has done it. I mean, there are stars that are really moving fast after ejections. So doesn't that seem to be a validation that nature is going to allow you to do this one way or another if you can figure out how to do it? Uh, yes. So, I mean, um, okay. The there are a few things to say here. I mean, so one thing is that still, I mean, that there's going to be still plenty of engineering difficulties, just practically speaking. So if you just imagine hypothetically us having a uh, Jupiter mass uh, war bubble in the solar system, then it means that we have a Jupiter mass object in the solar system. And we know that, for example, if we actually take, uh, you know, any any planet in the solar system and just little bit the it, then we, <laughs> it can all actually fall apart quite easily. So actually our solar system is quite a delicate system. So, I mean, we can't, I mean, we, we can we can lose stability if we just take one planet and shift it by 10% in its location, and that could be actually quite, uh, quite, quite, quite could have quite dramatic consequences. Uh, so, so, so th that's, that's an of caution. But then on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of benefits indeed from gravity and gravitational uh, just uh, wave slingshots and uh, all those mechanisms. Um, I, I saw another pretty fun video by <laughs> David Keeping and uh, actually had a paper on that, uh, wherein, you know, if, if you take two black holes, um, Two black holes in relatively close orbit, um, then one could use laser light, which I mean, so black holes tend to be uh, to bend lasers. So black holes tend to bend light because they, they're so strongly gravitating. So if one takes laser light and uh, shines it around the binary black hole, then one can, can in effect drain energy away from the binary black hole and uh, use that for their benefits and particular for, you know, for gaining momentum, for example. And uh, I instead, the binary black hole is going to be losing energy and getting tighter, so kind of getting more compact. So, you know, in a way, you could kind of use the black holes as, as a source of a lot of momentum. And so we could actually be able to gain momentum comparable to, uh, so we could to get velocities comparable to that uh, to those of the speed of light. In fact, not 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 so very different by order of magnitude, roughly speaking. So, uh, in principle, I mean, astrophysical sources, natural processes um, done on them can lead to very high velocities. Uh, and we know that stars, indeed, they they do a variety of things, and even some of them are non not cataclysmic, not dramatic. There's no, nothing really being destroyed, but they still can indeed uh, gain velocities quite easily, of order of like hundreds of kilometers per second, very easily. Um, maybe a bit more difficult is to get velocities of like thousands of kilometers per second um, but uh, those sort of velocities are 
quite way, way much higher than the velocities one can get with chemical rockets right now, and that definitely is a source of kind of getting to high speeds. Uh, with that note, of course, I mentioned before, so, I mean, one uh, one should, of course, make use of the astrophysical sources of getting velocity. I mean, perhaps it's a bit harder to do in the, in the solar system, um, but just generally, uh, I mean, like in the, uh, in the in the galaxy, there are definitely lots of places where one can create a lot of, uh, I mean, gain a lot of momentum. Uh, I mean, in fact, I think uh, just one could imagine sort of like this uh, hypothetical object flying from one star to another star, pre preferably binary uh, star, and kind of like getting like nudge from one, nudge from another, and kind of progressively in a targeted way, kind of getting to, to, to higher and higher velocities. Although, um, well, I, I don't know how practical is that, but uh, at least one could imagine objects kind of kind of using the galactic objects to, to get progressively large velocities. Now, David Kipping's idea of two black holes and a laser and gaining energy from it to accelerate. That also involves time dilation because you're going to be passing very near to a black hole. So that does that all cumulatively, I mean, is that is that the ultimate um, end point of this kind of a warp drive is that there's no upper limit on how fast you can make time go forward, right? So if you pass by that black hole, you're going to gain a kick in, in time dilation, right? Um, yes. So in principle, I think it all comes down to this uh, way relativity works somehow in a sense that when we have really strong gravity field, we just really curve space time. So we really change the way the um, time goes and really the way sort of the, the volumes are kind of deformed in them. But, but I think it's easier to relate to the time. And um, in principle, if we have, if, if we fly past a black hole and really fly close to the event horizon, then we can actually fly, fly close to the location where the time almost freezes as well. So uh, the only thing is that the only caveat is that uh, we cannot circle black hole really just next to event horizon. So uh, there's this sort of like last, uh, the concept of last stable circular orbit. So if you try to move in circle around the black hole, we can't really uh, kind of hover right above the event horizon. So uh, on a circular orbit, we would have to, you know, um, we would have some limited amount of uh, amount of time dilation. So um, and uh, in the same way, so if, if, if you took a real black hole, then we would be able to just come to the event horizon a little bit and fly out, uh, come fly out, and uh, that way experience the time dilation, but sort of like not, not really just constantly staying there. Now the next step is testing this. What's the smallest scale you can begin to sort of start to mess with this idea? I mean, um, what kind of masses are you looking for to sort of begin the experimentation if you, if you can do that at this point in time in our technology? Well, right now the experiments uh, in, in warp are going to be at the microscopic scale, the electron microscope scale. So the you know, the next two space race is most likely going to be very microscopic and small, simply because the energy requirements and the technical uh, capabilities that are needed are going to be much, much, much less than anything like practical for interstellar level. But at the same time, we don't need to do something like, you know, in order to have a craft propelled by warp, by alternate gravity from point A to point B, yes, this is something we can achieve at the microscopic level within our lifetimes very easily because the energy requirements and amounts are not anything out of our, you know, our current bounds. Uh, but of course, to make something more practical to send four human beings and an object, uh, you know, that becomes uh, a, lot, a lot of things have to happen, a lot more ahas a lot more papers, a lot more community building, like this, a lot of things have to happen for that level, uh, but it's all very achievable. That's that's where we at least see the next evolution. And uh, just to be clear, I think, I mean, like uh, in the in the lab, that, that definitely can be some progress made on the understanding of these sort of like space times and objects. Although, I mean, we don't propose any experiment yet, just because one should plan it very carefully before doing the experiment is a usual good advice for people doing experiments. Uh, but uh, it's foreseeably going to require quite a very uh, sensitive measurements of things and quite good planning. Um, and uh, there definitely can be some insight gained from sort of like uh, potentially, again, ex from, from experimentations. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, uh, they definitely can be connected to, to actual experiments, I believe. Uh, although, we, given that there's some good planning for that. Thanks for listening, I am Futurist and Science Fiction John, Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening, I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing, and be sure... And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever! Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Sell out. What?